Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I'm still not entirely sure what I'm going to do in the last hour. This is one of those days when I can hear Sheila Fogarty gnashing her teeth at my indecision and, and, and failure. It's one of the great advantages of going first. You get first dibs. Um, so keep your suggestions coming in. I, I, I want to look at Jeremy Corbyn and Brexit um, and the suggestion of how you would feel, whether you're uh, still persuaded that leaving is a good idea, whether you've realised that it's not, or whether you've realised all along, uh, albeit that your certainty has increased in the last couple of years, how you'd respond. Would, 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 would for example, would a Remainer Conservative contemplate voting for Jeremy Corbyn in the event of uh, the snap election that there were some suggestions this weekend Theresa May might call in the autumn? I don't know. Um, but there's a brilliant piece in The Times today uh, e examining and explaining just how much power he could potentially broke if he adopted that position. Um, I'm going to talk next, and I really need your help with this. There are a few things. I, I, I take a bit of a mea culpa here. I, I, I often... It's probably not the time to do it when you've just recorded your biggest audience in history, but I, I'm often looking for things that we do wrong on the programme, and I've, I've realised after the Windrush story that I take my lead from the enemy too often. I take my lead from whatever is dominating the right-wing agenda, and then I offer up my response and my defence. Um, and it's great, and it works, and I will continue to do so on, on big occasions. But sometimes I think we should start at the other end of the rainbow and actually look at the report from the perception of reality rather than from the perception of right-wing manipulation. And the reality of benefit sanctions is something that we've never really discussed before. In fact, I, I, I fall into the trap of responding to the narrative of feckless work shy layabout, sometimes angrily, always pointing out to caller after caller after caller when back in the day it was the unemployed who were at the top of the hit list for the two minute of hate every morning it wasn't it wasn't foreigners i don't know if you can remember you remember it was when everyone had a flat screen television that was the phrase and they'd be spending all their benefits on fags and booze and flat screen televisions while the rest of us had to go out to work and they mobilized that hatred very powerfully whenever you spoke to anybody about these appalling examples of feckless work shy layabouts it was it was always two or three stages away it was someone's cousin's friend or someone's brother's sister-in-law or something like that and they do exist of course they do any system at all will have people that game it the question that societies face is how much gaming you tolerate in order to protect everybody else this is my understanding of the welfare state i would rather have a safety net in which some people inexplicably choose to behave as if it's a trampoline. You know, I, I don't understand the absence of aspiration. It's possibly a failing on my part, actually. It may be a bit like yesterday's conversation about retail, where you just don't understand. I just don't understand well, what it would be like now to work in a shop on an essential subsistence wage. It was a great tweet. Stayed with me. I'll tell you, it sums up the point I'm trying to make. It's always fun to hear people with great jobs complaining about people with rubbish jobs not smiling enough. That was me. Guilty as charged. Completely. Yesterday. There you go. I'm admitting I was wrong. I'm not saying that I've decided to retract that comment in order to avoid embarrassment and being a distraction for the leadership of the party. Um, and, and, I, and I think on the benefit stuff, we may have fallen into a similar trap. I think I've spent too much time fighting the narrative that's just not true, as opposed to trying to get to the depth of what is true, using that as the starting point. Eight minutes after 11 is the time. Because this report is... I, I mean, this is actually disgusting. I... I I don't need to tell you that the right-wing newspapers today have focused on Michael Gove's suggestions that we might survive with fewer wood-burning stoves. Um, obviously, it's an environmental story about clean air, but to see that on the front of the Telegraph, when this story has been published, this study has been published, I find incredible. Um, it's, it's been undertaken by the University of York, and it has essentially found that so-called benefit sanctions are useless when it comes to getting jobless people into work. And they are actually more likely to reduce those affected to poverty, ill health, or even, and here's a phrase you really shouldn't be hearing in 21st century UK, survival crime. Remember yesterday, we, we quoted a judge saying, I have no choice but to send a man to prison 
for the crime of begging because he was hungry. And now we hear about survival crime. This is the country's most extensive study of what's called welfare conditionality um, that's ever been undertaken. It's taken five years. The conclusion is this. Benefit sanctions do little to enhance people's motivation to prepare for, seek or enter paid work. They routinely trigger profoundly negative personal, financial, health and behavioural outcomes. Um, I just want you to tell me your stories. And I will take first or second hand on this because some of the lives being led by people who have been sanctioned can be quite chaotic. I don't know how many will be listening today. I hope you are. And I apologise for, for not having done as much on this issue as, as perhaps I should have done. I have, in my defence, done more on it over the last few years than I ever did on Windrush before that dam broke last month. But the, the stories are, are, are astonishing. So you get a sanction. I'll tell you what I know from knowledge and then you tell me what you know from experience, right? That's a good way of doing things. And if you are like me, relying entirely on knowledge rather than experience, hopefully we'll come to a slightly rounder understanding of, of, of what has been going on in our country for the last uh, seven or eight years. So it was in 2013 when sanctions hit their peak. Ian Duncan Smith in charge at the Department of Work and Pensions. More than a million sanctions were imposed. Between 2010 and 2015, a quarter of all people on Job Seekers Allowance were sanctioned. The DWP issued £132 million pounds in sanctions penalties in 2015. So this is what happens, OK? A claimant supposedly breaches job centre rules, um, typically by failing to turn up for appointments or by not applying for enough jobs. As a result of that, they are effectively fined by having their benefit payments stopped for a minimum of about four, for a minimum of four weeks and a maximum of three years. Now, as I read you these words. I find myself wondering whether it really was the case that some of society's poorest people would be punished for missing an appointment by having the pittance that they currently survive on withdrawn. And then I remember the climate that, that these policies were introduced in. I remember sitting here and hearing decent people completely persuaded that everybody on any form of unemployment benefit was some sort of Jack the Lad character living at large at taxpayers' expense. And what we've discovered in subsequent years, of course, is that the way all of these people, these weird right-wing think tanks and these alliances and organisations that persuade people like you and me that our taxes are being wasted, they are not interested in us. Most of us are net takers from society. Over the course of our lives, especially if we get poorly, we will take more out of the pot than we put in. So the people that drive these think tanks, the people that drive these ideologies, the people that sponsor these politicians, they're the ones who hate having to see their fortunes going in tiny part, usually, towards looking after ordinary people. It's, it's why far-right ideology always starts with minorities. Why are we paying for Jews? Why are we paying for the disabled? Why are we supporting this? Why are we paying for that? And the unemployed, for, I mean, probably half of my time in this job, were the perfect recipients of this. Because a bit like Immigrants after Brexit, when everybody started saying, no, I didn't mean you. I voted because there's too many immigrants. Do you, do, you, do you know any? Yeah, no, but I didn't mean them. The ones I know are great. I mean all the ones, you know, the hordes, the ones in the posters, the ones in the, in the, in the, in the stories, the comment sections. I mean them. So that happened first. We should have seen the welfare state as almost a, a rehearsal for that kind of rhetoric. Because when we talked about unemployment benefit, we very rarely meant our dad or ourselves. We always meant that fellow who's knocking around with his sister-in-law, who's been signing on and working. Do you see what I mean? There was just this perception. Oh, man, because if they did it to the welfare state, they're not going to really struggle that hard to do it to the NHS. The entrenched wealth, I mean, serious wealth. Have a look at the royal wedding and contemplate the society that sustained down, what's it called, Downton Abbey-style scenarios. Just think about that, because I, I often wonder whether I'm going a little bit um, up the drain pipe or down the rabbit hole. To sustain a Downton Abbey-style society, which was us, you know, 
uh, uh, it's not just over a hundred years ago, not that long ago, to sustain that society, you have to have a tiny, tiny number of privileged people and an army of worker bees, an absolute army. How could you possibly sustain a society full of stately homes where a family of 12 employed a staff of 1,200 unless you had absolutely succeeded in persuading people that that is some form of justice, that's a natural order. I always think of St. Catherine's Dock. If you're not familiar with London, you know Tower Bridge, I'm sure, iconically. Next to Tower Bridge, there's a, a marina, a, a very smart marina. It's lovely. Um, and there's hotels there and boutiques and, and homes. And when it was built, it was a slum, right? St. Catherine's Dock was a slum. They moved out 30 or 40,000 people at the beginning of the 19th century and built St. Catherine's Dock. Incidentally, for fans of trivia and pub quizzes, they moved all the soil and rubble to Pimlico and put it on the marshland, which is how Pimlico became habitable, just a few miles further up the Thames. But the 30 or 40,000 people, I forget which, the number is recorded, I just haven't got it at the tip of my tongue. 30 or 40,000 people moved out of St. Catherine's Dock, right? Do you know where they went? No. Nobody does. Because there was no requirement by government to rehouse them or, or to care for them. They just wanted to redevelop the land where they lived. So they knocked everything down, moved the people out, and that was it. And, and I know this is an extreme leap, but if you can persuade a population that unemployed people who don't go for a meeting or who make a mistake on their paperwork or who can't prove that they've spent 35 hours looking for jobs in the course of a week, you take away the what, 70 quid a week that they live on? That demonstrates a similar, I would say, disregard for their welfare that you saw during Dickens' times. So, I went off on one there, for which I make no apology, because I think history is the thing that, that hopefully can steer us back off this crazy path that we're all on at the moment. Really, really, really rich people who secretly spend money promoting journalists and think tanks and... Well, not secretly, actually. I'm sounding like I'm doing a Zionist conspiracy now. They spend huge amounts of money sponsoring organisations, think tanks and alliances that are dedicated to persuading ordinary people that they pay too much tax. And the way you do that is by pointing at the recipients of the money and misrepresenting them all as feckless workshy layabouts, sponging immigrants or worse. And that's why sanctions should have been a national scandal. But that's just my opinion. What's yours? Where we've found two hostile environments in recent years and probably missed the recent weeks, recent days. Hostile environment for the homeless yesterday um, as a result of measures brought in in 2014 by the then Home Secretary, drumroll, Theresa May. Uh, hostile environment for Windrush families. Um, as a result of the policies brought in at the Home Office actually called hostile environment by drum roll, Theresa May. She doesn't get the blame for this one. This is Ian Duncan Smith, who um, currently uh, doesn't have a role in government, but is almost cheerleader in chief from the backbenches for the continuing Brexit debacle. And he was responsible for welfare sanctions, and we didn't talk about them enough. And now research has been published which suggests they make everything worse. You can challenge that but only with knowledge and experience, because we've had enough of opinion, i.e. mine. Kevin's in Derry. Kevin, what made you pick up the phone? James, uh, first-time caller. You're very um, welcome. And it's, it's something that's always bugged me. I used to work for the Social Security Agency here in Northern Ireland. Yes. And so part of my duties was to go out and visit claimants to get forms filled in, uh, give them advice or whatever. Um, and I always remember one particular incident where I had to call and speak with a young single mum. Uh, I arrived unannounced uh, to find a cold house, no floor coverings, no uh, carpets. Uh, she had a little kid, I think it was 18 months, two years. Um, very little food in the cupboards, nothing in the, in the fridge. Um, the house was decrepit and uh, she was waiting maybe six weeks as a result of a sanction. What had she been because sanctioned for, do we know? She, yeah, there was a query of, of, a, of a, a supposed um, lodger slash boyfriend right. to be living with it. Um, but on her insistence, I, I got a look around the house and, that I could see and I had arrived on a nice James. Mm. There was nothing there that, that indicated anyone else. She may have had a boyfriend, but there was nothing there that I could say, you know, uh, definitely so this is, sense of something there. This is where... 
I, I, I still like to think, despite so much evidence to the contrary, um, this is where compassion kicks in normally, and then people who are decent and could be compassionate get fed a little line at this point, which allows them to turn their conscience off. And that line would be, well, if she couldn't afford that baby, she never should have had it. And then somehow sure, we can uh, turn, yeah. we can shut down the rest of the conversation yeah. and ignore the plight of that, that those two human beings. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you, if you had seen the condition that she was living in, and, and, and I emphasise that I called out unannounced. Yes, I know. Uh, I understand why. You know, there was no there was no opportunity for her to. You know, you do get people who would maybe chance their arm or whatever, but this girl was clearly in desperate, desperate need. Um, and this was before the food banks and, and things like that had become commonplace. The uh, bedroom tax was probably a few people are pointing out was probably the first alarm bell that got ignored by. Um, yes decent people wasn't it the the notion because that that in principle it made some sense but then it turned out that in practice the numbers were all wrong and there simply weren't the yeah. type of properties that people could move into to free up the properties that had a bedroom that wasn't being used in and, and people ended up in all sorts of trouble totally i mean i, I mean uh, another side of my story is that i left i left the civil service then i we had a little boy who was diagnosed with Down syndrome at birth and um we had to claim disability living allowance f for him. Yes. And again, you would listen in to phone in shows and, and read comments on Twitter and oh. Facebook about the DLA being this sop to the, the, the scroungers and, and buying them their flat screen TVs. Because they'd find yeah. somebody working out as a bricklayer who'd also been yeah. claiming it for a bad back and they'd conclude yeah. that lads like yours don't deserve the support of, of, totally. of society, yeah. civilization. Well, and and it used to, it used to, you, you, you knew that that was the case, but when they were making these comments, they didn't specify. They just said of that course. all the claimants of these benefits are, are scroungers and they're out for their own gain. Ignoring the total needs of of the people claiming them, and it's just it, it's it gave me a, a total different insight as to having worked in the agency. And yes, then yes, I can imagine. Side, you know? I can imagine. Here's the line, actually. Yeah. I mean, in terms of looking for the evidence, the Economic and Social Research Council funded welfare conditionality study was carried out between 2013 and 2018 by researchers at six universities. It included repeat qualitative interviews over two years with 481 welfare service users in England and Scotland, as well as interviews with 57 policy experts and 27 focus groups. And then I um, go towards my inbox, and I, I don't want to bully anyone on this one because I think it is easy to understand how people have ended up in this position. So, Ben Benson, I, 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 I say this to you with love, mate. I've just read you the evidence and the information to explain why this is a kosher study and you quite understandably given the climate that kevin and i have just described you write so james can you explain why two families in my road both on social never work got kids one in florida one in spain on holiday my wife and i work we can't afford that so don't tell me sanctions aren't good i say work or no pay plenty jobs about that's why so many eu nationals are here there is no earthly way that anyone on your street could be holidaying in florida and living a uh, luxurious lifestyle if they're existing solely on benefits. On and if benefits, they're not existing yeah. solely on benefits, then they're criminals. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's frightening to hear when people come out with those kind of statements, James. And one of the things about the young mother that I was telling you about, yes. she had um, her, her family and her mum had been on benefits and came from a very socially deprived background, um, very little education. So there was, they, they were almost caught in a trap. Yes, and it was of course. very easy from outside to sit and say, oh, they're just dossers and look like mother, like daughter, and so mm. on and so on. The circle continues. But when you actually got to meet these people and you heard their story and you realised they didn't have much, they didn't have much help, they didn't have much guidance, they didn't have the financial ability to, to get themselves out of these situations, it was horrendous. Yes, and, and of course there will be people responding to that description by, by simply saying, well, that's very, very sad, but why should I pay for it? Or indeed, they'll say to people like you, well, if it's so, if you care so much, why don't you put them up in your back bedroom? And not realising as they buy into that kind of rhetoric that they're perpetuating problems for the future and possibly exposing their own children should they end up in a vulnerable position to precisely the sort of callousness that they're now practising themselves. Getting a lot of calls from Northern Ireland. Do they have radar diaries in Northern Ireland? Can we check? I hope they do. Um, Kevin, take care. Nick is in Camberley. Nick, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, James. Hello, uh, Nick. Everyone, experience-based. Yes. Um, I, I turned up two or three minutes late for an appointment at the job centre in Reading. Yes. Um, and by the time I'd navigated through yeah, the security guards, the reception desk, the queues... You'd never been to one before, I take it? Oh, no, this was, this was the fourth or fifth time I'd... Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, 
And by the time I you know, was allowed through to walk upstairs to where the universal credit yes. is, um, it was more than 10 minutes after the appointment time. So you, tur you turned up at the building in good time, but by the time you actually got to the room you were supposed to be in, you were 10 minutes late. So, yes. and I got a sanction of eight days' benefit. So that means that you have no money for eight days? Uh, 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 they withheld, yeah, I mean, far more than what was then my daily budget. I yes. Mean, meeting budget. Uh, I, just, I just couldn't believe it. And this was done by letter. So they'd actually already applied the sanction before they sent the letter. Uh, it, it's just brutal. <laughs> um, I, I hope you won't say this the wrong way, but you, because you, I'm reading just into your voice and, 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 and accent, you don't, you don't sound like the kind of people that we're supposed to think of when we hear about sanctions. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you, but... Uh... I don't know that it is. It might be very rude of me, actually, or judgmental, but, but you're, you're supposed to be drunk or high on drugs or flogging stolen tellies out the back of your van or holidaying in Florida and Spain 17 times a yeah. year. Do you, do you see what I mean? This is... You, you, you sound like... I'm an IT consultant, James. I work, I work my nuts off for investment banks, insurance companies, all that stuff. But occasionally you just get a bit of a gap between jobs and then there was a bit of a family emergency. I took some time off to look after my girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. No, not blah, blah, blah. Life, life, life. Well, this is it, yeah. Yes. And they, just, they, just, they give no quarter whatsoever. I mean, just... Just appalling. And we're back to, I, I hope you don't mind me conflating the two, but we're back to Windrush, aren't we? Because they don't okay. care about you. They just care about that number. So you go down as an eight-day sanction, and when they publish the £132 million in sanctions that were issued in 2015, they get a pat on the back from the newspapers. Yes, yes. Well, we, we've saved a load of money because we're not giving it to these horrible, drunk, nasty drug dealer people. Exactly, yeah. yeah. How, um, how did you survive for that eight days? I mean, were you all right? Because... You were less exposed than some people, I imagine, to, to, to poverty. Um, yes. Yeah, I had to, yeah. And we pay, we pay our taxes in expectation of support when we are not paying our taxes. Uh, I mean, I just had to go and, you know, sponge off my parents, really, for a couple of weeks. Which puts you in a privileged position that not everybody else would be able to enjoy. My late father signed on when, when he was made redundant by the Daily Telegraph, and, and I was a bit embarrassed at the time, um, and he explained to me that that is, it was quite an early lesson in what the welfare state represents because I, you know, I had spent my entire life at private school. I had a very, very skewed view of deserving and undeserving and Dad just explained, he said, son, I've paid taxes since I was 15 years old. I'm on my uppers and not only, you know, the money isn't necessarily the, the main reason for doing it at the moment because he got a redundancy check, but equally you, you also get access to training and a help with CVs and all that. Oh, God, the idea of, of that system so proud, decent men somehow being reduced to what Nick just described because of Ian Duncan Smith's weird fetishisation of poverty. 11.30 is the time. Thomas Watts is here with the headline. Benefit sanctions found to be ineffective and damaging. Absolutely no improvements to the lives of people sanctioned, but, of course, pats on the back for politicians from the ranting right-wing media that portrayed everyone unemployed as some sort of sponging work shy layabout. And what I love about conversations like this, when I get them right, and I don't always, I accept that, is the insight it provides into how different people can process identical information and end up in completely different places. So this is um, Jeremiah's response to Ben's tweet earlier about his neighbours who, who go on holiday all the time and uh, clearly are living the life of Riley and, and him and his wife work and can't and have a, he believes, an inferior lifestyle. So Jeremiah says, if that guy with the people on his street go on holiday to Florida and Spain and he can't afford it and they can, why doesn't he just shut up and get on benefits? Why, why keep working if, if he can have all that by being unemployed? Um, you add that he's a liar. I don't agree that he's necessarily a liar. I, but there is clearly no way that his neighbours are living the life he describes while existing exclusively on Social Security. So they're scamming the system. And you don't use the people who scam the system as the reason why you did denigrate the system. You just don't. It's ridiculous. It'd be like shutting shops because of shoplifters. You see? But this lady... Uh, Julia heard exactly the same anecdote and responded in a completely different way. She says, of course these people can live on benefits, plus child support and holidays to Florida are quite cheap. They can easily have more money than those who work and don't claim. If they were hard up, they wouldn't be having a load of babies. No one actually mentioned babies. Um, 
the original tweet or text didn't actually mention boobs, but there you go. So Julia automatically, and then she adds, get real. So same story, anecdotal, Ben on his street, got a couple of neighbours who are on benefits and apparently have superior lifestyles to him and his wife who work, and there he therefore arrives at the conclusion that benefit sanctions are a good idea, despite the fact that if the people on his street really were living at large on benefits, then you can guarantee they'd never been sanctioned because eight days with no money, three weeks with no money, three years with no money. But it's not, it's enough. It's enough. Like the immigrant who simultaneously comes over here and steals our jobs while claiming our benefits. Schrodinger's immigrant. It's the same thing and it's everywhere now. I don't know how you get it back in, but I think we need to a little bit more here just to keep pointing it out. 11.37 is the time. Otherwise, you get mugged by things like Windrush. You get completely taken by surprise when you should have been clear. It's a hostile environment for the homeless. There's a hostile environment for the unemployed. There's a hostile environment for the foreigner. There's a hostile environment for the Windrush generation. Linda is in Huddersfield. Linda, what can you tell us? Oh, hi there. Yeah, I have to start by saying um, until I fell ill, I'd worked all my life. I've been quite successful. Yes. Um, and I fell ill at the age of 42 That's and then landed right. on benefit. Yes, OK. Um, I've not been sanctioned yet. I've been through pretty well everywhere else, um, everything else with the benefit system. Yes. Um, I fell ill with depression. I was in work at the time, but unable to complete the contract. So um, I went on to, at that time, I went on to income support, which is what you claimed when you had children under a certain age. Yes. Um, I because you couldn't to, work. <clears throat> Yeah, I couldn't work and, you know, I was on yeah. my way to getting better. Um, I, th I think, you know, as a single parent, you were just sort of entitled to that, to maybe yes. spend time with your kids or give yourself some breathing space. But I ended up, about a year afterwards, I ended up going into uni just part-time, an afternoon a week, um, to go back into teaching, which I'd done 10 years of abroad. Oh, yeah. After two out of three years of the course, they stopped my income support just at the time my son had a birthday, and just at the time I was applying for the third year. So did they tell you why? Well, I, actually, they did apologise for it. They shouldn't have done it, and I, I think I got about 50 quid compensation. So, in the meantime, I wasn't able to complete that final year. Right. I was on Job Seekers, so I had to search for work, which I desperately did. You know, I was desperate to escape. Yes. Um, but, you know, I was, I was going to... Did they not abolish income support for everybody? Yeah, I don't think you can get it now. No. And I think, I think you're only entitled to the equivalent up to... At my time, it was 11 years old, the youngest child, 11. OK, now we're going three. back a bit so here, aren't we? To spend time, yeah, about 10, 11 years. Yeah, so, so before, the, with your kids before, before the sanctions were brought in. Yep, yep. But this, the struggling, uh, struggling to get by on benefits, and I suppose for me as well, I've been pretty comfy, so it was a really big shock. Yes. Um, that struggling, and I, I, I do remember the icing on the cake was when my son, I'd saved money and my mum had helped me to get my son Clark's shoes for school, uh, the new school year. Yes. And on his first day back, someone nicked them. <laughs> and you and couldn't replace them. Me. It was, it was like only 50 quid. No. I mean, that's a week's money now. It was only for a bit, destroyed me. And I had a nervous breakdown, spent three, three months in hospital. I've had two breakdowns since. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, w one of which was just after I'd had an assessment. Yeah. Um, which was hell anyway. It was torture anyway. Um, but I only found out that I got zero points after my... Uh, p payment hadn't arrived. Oh, so I found out by not being able to pay bills that day or buy any food. <laughs> well, you kept your <laughs> sense of humour. Oh, well, it's, you, you know, today's a good day, I, oh, I hear you, I hear you. But, you know, it's absolutely destroyed my life and I started off in a decent rented place and yes. went down and down and down so I was in a dump. I've now found a place, but it was hell because no one accepts housing benefit or benefits anymore, few and far between. And then, like, getting together removal costs, stuff and like that. And you're poorly. This is the point, charity. isn't it? It's, it, it is, yeah. it's poorly people who've, who've borne the brunt of yeah. these um, reassessments and distinctions and discriminations. It's, it's, it's why the first caller referenced DLA in the context of his son and said that got demonised. It got turned into something ugly when, in fact, it's something we should be proud of. Linda gets right. taken ill and the state steps in to look after her. For about four years, I couldn't speak. Until fairly recently, I think we've reached the anniversary now. I really, you know, I could squeak a bit and that was it. Um, just utterly destroyed. Oh, my um, love. And the whole time, 
I was feeling like an absolute perfect, pathetic failure because, you know, I used to be capable of this and I used to be capable of, capable of that. And I wrote myself off as a lazy benefits grounder. You know, I was just lazy. And I remember my ex-husband calling me lazy and things like that. Um, and it just adds you know, to, the, to the narrative, yeah. doesn't it? And I'd had everything, if you like, and, you know, it was my fault that I lost it. I hear you, and I, I'm glad you're in a better place today, but I appreciate that it, 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 it's a question of taking each day as it comes. So you, you describe a system going back before the sanctions were brought in, but um, obviously far from perfect even then and considerably worse. Subsequently, Linda, I hope we talk again about happier topics. I'm, I'm going to move on because I, I suppose I should have known this would happen. I'm being bombarded with calls. And that makes me feel even worse about not having talked about this before. You know, when you say that someone's out of touch, and I'm not quite sure what you mean, and, and usually it's in the context of a conversation about immigration. And I say, well, how can I be out of touch? How can anyone living in a big city be out of touch with immigration? I'm really out of touch. I was touched yesterday with people working in shops. I always remember that line. I always love to hear people with great jobs complaining about people with rubbish jobs not smiling more. Guilty. And I don't know about people like Linda. I get on my high horse about the bedroom tax and try and land a few punches on the politicians. But actually, how, how do you survive if they've taken away the only income you have for a maximum of three years? And Ken Loach makes a film about it. And, um gets rounded on by the usual suspects for being inaccurate and misrepresentative. Uh, Rochelle is in Rossendale in Lancashire. Rochelle, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Hello, mate. Um, so, so, for me, I had a, a wonderful career in the NHS um, until four years ago when I went out into my front garden and had a massive epileptic seizure out of the blue. Oh, no kind of warning. So, uh, I had to give up my job for various reasons. I'm um, yeah. a wheelchair user. I have a lot, lot of difficulties. And I was on contribution-based ESA. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, I was called in for a uh, reassessment. Yes. Um, and what happened in that assessment was that I said, no, the doctor didn't lie as such, but what she did was omit things and make assumptions about things. So, for example, she asked me, how long do you spend in the shower every day? And I said, yeah, about 10 minutes. And she put in the report that I can wash my own hair. She didn't ask me that question. When, when you say a doctor, is this, this is your GP, is it? No, this is um, one of the... Um, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a doctor, Rochelle. Well, she signed the assessment as doc, as, as a doctor. Oh well, that's me told. But I, I, I've certainly heard tales of the assessors not having medical qualifications. So, can, how long do you spend in the shower? Ten minutes. Can she wash her own hair unaided? Yes, she can. I see exactly what you mean. Yeah. So she's she's just made these assumptions. So what happened then is that. Um, I realised my payment was a little bit short, so I, I thought, right, OK, they've, they've put me in the work-related group. But I didn't get a letter. I actually only received the letter yesterday. And in the short term, I've missed the job centre appointment that I didn't know I had. And I'm now facing possible sanction. Has that happened before? Have you been sanctioned before? No, because I've always been in what they call a support group before. Right. But because they've put me in this work-related group. But, you know, how can I go to an appointment that I doesn't, don't know exists? You know, it's, 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 it's impossible. And I, have I you pointed this out to them? Sister. Yes, I have pointed it out. I asked them, would I be sanctioned? And they said, it's up to your advisor at the job centre. Problem is, nobody's told me who that advisor is. So you... at this or whatever it's called. I don't know who that is at this point in time. And the reason you've been moved groups is because as a result of that medical assessment, they think you're more ready for work than you were previously. Yeah, and the natural fact, I'm actually less ready for work than I was previously. And the reality is, as I tried to explain to them hmm. a few days ago, if I, was, if I felt that I could go to work, there is... There are jobs for me. I know, you know, I know my capabilities. And there are jobs that I could go and do. And, but I can't. And, that, I, and know, no one, no one listens. Seconds, no yeah. one listens and all the work you did previously counts, counts for naught. And, and this can't, I mean, be explained away as anything other than 
trying to blame you for your own situation. Rochelle, keep in touch on that one, because um, I, I, I'm not suggesting that we can do anything to help, but we can certainly shine a light on what's happening to you. And I apologise that I have to move on now. It's 11.46. Um, more on the spreading of the hostile environment, I think, imminently. But first, we continue to mark the first anniversary, um, uh, incredible though that seems, of the terror attack on the Manchester Arena during that Ariana Grande concert. Um, Andy Burnham is, of course, the mayor of Manchester, and he, he joins me now. Uh, Mr Burnham, how much of it is, um, is a sort of municipal uh, uh, event today, and how much of it is, is grassroots, so to speak? I think it's uh, both, uh, James, isn't it? We obviously have a, a formal part of the day at the uh, cathedral with the Prime Minister and uh, and the uh, uh, and the Prince. Uh, but then later in the evening, the community will very much come together. And while it will be in front of the town hall and civic leaders and religious leaders will be there, it's the community that are coming to the fore, particularly our survivors choir, who, uh, you've not heard them, you know, people will be really, you know, so moved by, by them. Uh, these are people, young people, people, many of them, who were at the concert, who've come together and, uh, you know, supporting each other and, uh, yeah, it, it, there won't be a dry, dry eye in Albert Square later. And they've been doing it as a form of therapy as well, as a form of, kind of, as, 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 a, as just a hobby, because it, it, it helps, doesn't it, to, to recover from trauma? Uh, absolutely, James. I, I saw them rehearse on Saturday and, you know, I could see that, you know, they're all holding each other as they're singing and, yeah, it's very, very moving. And, um, but that's been the story of, of this uh, a great city over the last year. People have been there for each other. Um, we are a city in recovery, but, you know, a year on, we're stronger, we're more together. The sense of community spirit symbolised by that worker bee mm. uh, image has, has only grown over the last uh, over the last year. So the, the scars underneath are deep and they're real, but, you know, we, we can definitely say that this city is more together than ever before. How, how did news of the attack um, reach you a year ago? Well, it was a very ordinary day in many ways. I was only just elected, if you like, in my new role, but uh, I'd been kind of uh, enjoying life out of Westminster. I'd, it was my dad's birthday, and I'd just dropped off a present, and I'd played five-a-side with my brothers, and I was at home watching Newsnight when my counterpart, the mayor of uh, Liverpool, uh, started ringing my phone, and when I answered it, he was in a panic because his daughters were at the arena, and that's how I first heard. So a very ordinary day was, was shattered in that way. And then the chief constable gave me the news, and I can just remember, James, an overwhelming sense of nausea when I when I heard the news. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, you know, sick to the pit of my stomach, and uh, kind of wondered how we would get through it. And what followed was the darkest of nights I've ever lived through, actually. Uh, and as I came into Manchester and spoke on the steps of the town hall. I said after that darkest of nights we were facing up to the most difficult of dawns but a year on we have done that and we have faced up to things and that's why I'm so proud of this of this place and the people. I, I, finally Andy Burnham I know that there was an, an attempted march at the weekend seeking to to exploit the tragedy for, for rather ugly ends um it didn't it didn't go well but do you how do you, as, a, as an elected politician, deal with the constituency of people who think that the correct way to react to something like this terror attack is to be more angry and more hateful and to take out our frustrations on people who had nothing to do with it but may share ostensibly a religion with the people who did? It's a simple answer, James. That's what the terrorists want. That they want hate. They want division. They want a cycle of violence. So why would anybody do any, what they want? Uh, I know there are people out there, voices out there today, seeking to exploit this anniversary. But, you know, the people of Manchester are streetwise. They know what's what's what, and they know what people are, are doing. And, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they won't be swayed. I mean, the message that came out from here last year, and you'll hear again today, is yes. this city, these people, will never be beaten, broken, changed in any way by by extremism of any kind and uh, that that message will ring out loud and clear later andy burnham mayor of manchester many thanks indeed for your time on this extremely poignant anniversary of that islamist terror attack on the manchester arena exactly one year ago 11 55 is the time continuing our conversation about um uh, the hostile environment that, that the, the research into benefit sanctions appears to have created or at least described and wondering perhaps why, why why isn't stuff like this in the news more 
I mean, we genuinely today have two or three front pages dedicated to Michael Gove's announcement earlier regarding wood-burning stoves. Gove's stoves. And yet a story that suggests we have been embarked upon a systematic, multi-year exploitation isn't quite the right word, denigration, demonization, diminishment of, of some of society's most vulnerable people. And it's so obvious when you start talking, how do they get away with it? Well, because they don't portray these people as vulnerable. They portray them as being on holiday in Florida every other weekend. 11.55 is the time. Robert is in Rochester. Robert, what can you tell me? Hello. Well, Hello. as somebody who's severely dyslexic and illiterate, when I had to go through that system because I was homeless and lost my job due to constructive dismissal, but that's a whole other story. Um, basically, uh, they've introduced this online system, which is uh, all whistling, all singing for everybody who is able to read and write. But when you're homeless and you have no access to computers and yes. you're told go to the library and your phone, basically, the only thing it can do if you can hold enough charge in it. You've got a mobile phone? Um, I no, you can't, possibly, phone, you can't yeah. possibly be poor. Yeah, I bet you've got yeah. a flat screen TV as well, haven't you? No, I was homeless. Uh, oh, I, yeah, where well, you say that, you probably had a flat screen TV in your doorway. Did you? Do you own shoes? No, I had a car. <laughs> oh, there you go. Which I slept in, so oh, therefore... Yes. I, I technically wouldn't call myself a rough sleeper, even though I'd be considered hind and homeless. Indeed but anyway. you would. Carry on. Um, so, obviously, that's uh, the sort of effect I was in there. But one thing I did notice is there seems to be so many members of staff in the job centre, but very little time to spend with anybody. Now, somebody who has a disability like myself or yes. a more physical disability, they're supposed to spend 45 minutes with. I had five minutes at any one time and I was going in there being told off for not going online enough because you're supposed to do 39 hours or whatever of job searching and proof of three or four hours worth of computer searching. However, if you see a lot of people there are low in money yes. or being sanctioned, the only place they can go is to a library and the maximum time you can get on a library is 30 minutes if you've got a membership card. You, uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're a rare but not unique individual, aren't you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't say so. <laughs> <laughs> so. I hope we all are. But, but I, I don't mean that on a very, very personal level. I just mean that most systems probably have chinks in their armour when it comes to somebody who is illiterate, who is, as a result, yeah. I presume, of your dyslexia, you're completely unable to navigate the written and, and, and the written word. Yeah. And, and yeah, I, right. I'm not... I'm, I'm just pointing out that that is not going to be unique to the DWP, that there'll be lots of other places where you would be at a huge disadvantage as, yeah. as a result of your condition. But the, uh, the, the picture you paint is one where nobody would make any effort to try to understand or accommodate your situation. That's exactly how it is. It, to be completely fair, that is the whole of society, it seems, as <laughs> moving forward. But it's just a poignant point that yes. I work for a discount retailer because I got put through a forced employment. What, what, what does that mean? Uh, basically, that if I didn't turn up for the day that they... Well, a lot of people will say it's a good thing that um, I went for this interview, yes. which I was going to do anyway, regardless, but... If you hadn't uh, gone, you'd have been sanctioned. I would have been sanctioned, and all of my benefit would have been stopped for, I think, that would have been a month or whatever. So you've um, lost any ability, any autonomy then, as I understand it, is that you, you yeah. can't do what most of us would expect to be able to do if we found ourselves unemployed. It would be to take a little bit of time to work out what you want to do. And I don't yeah. want to do that job, I, but, but um, I know that that job's coming up and I'd like to go down that road. What you're describing essentially is, is a system of being ordered to take any job that's available, whether you want it or whether it suits you or not, yeah. regardless of what your employment history is. And if you don't take it, you will starve. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, obviously I'm glad you're in work. You're in a better place now than you were when you were sleeping in your car, I hope. I am. Um, I have a wonderful two-bedroom flat now. I've right. got my kids now get to... 
Enjoy Good. as well so as I do. That, 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 I suppose, is, is, is how you can somehow portray it as a positive. We're, we're just on a journey, a journey of discovery. You don't have to recognise what we find. You can pretend you can't see it, but um, I'm going to carry on digging. We're looking at benefit sanctions. We're looking at close to incontrovertible evidence that they have done absolutely nothing to help jobless people into work and are much more likely to have reduced those affected to poverty, ill health or even crime. What would you do if they took away all your income for three years? I'd go out and get a job. Fair point. What if you couldn't? Due to health reasons. Or simple unemployability. Chaos. Last caller, completely illiterate, can neither read nor write, now has a job in a discount store. Feels that he's capable of better, but if he hadn't gone to that interview and accepted that job, they'd have taken away his sanctions. How would you feel if you were ordered to do that job there? Regardless of, of, of what, where your skills and, and past lay, or ambitions lay, how would you feel? Whatever you're doing now, whether you're flying a jumbo jet, you probably shouldn't have me on in the cockpit, whether you're flying a jumbo jet or whether you're stacking shelves in a supermarket. So you have to go and do that job now. Say to the pilot, you've got to go and stack the shelves. Nothing wrong with stacking shelves. I, and it's unfortunate that it's become a sort of byword for low-rent employment, especially given yesterday's conversation about retail wages. But I, I just, I, I never really understand, and I suspect now I'm 46, I never will. Um... The difficulty in just doing the there but for the grace of God thing, you know? What would, how would I feel if I was told, if I, if I lost this job, couldn't get another one, signed on after a month or two, and then got told you've got to take that job in Poundland, otherwise you lose whatever income you have. And, it, and, and you don't just lose whatever income you have, you, you, the help you get paying your rent or your accommodation expenses or the stuff that's been put there as a disability living allowance, you lose it all if you don't, don't, don't take that job. How long do you have to be unemployed for before that becomes a reasonable response? Does it ever become a reasonable response? Will it ever be reasonable for you? But we never, never, never ask these questions because we're too convinced that they've all got flat screen TVs and a holiday home in Florida. Look, so that's why I'm going to take a few more calls on this because I should have done it a lot sooner and I'm sorry that I didn't. Laura is in Glasgow. Laura, what would you like to say? Hiya. Um, my story is slightly different from the people that have phoned before. Yeah. Um, I've always worked, um, and I'm a carer for my mum, okay. um, and I only claimed um, carer's allowance after my mum became really unwell, and I couldn't work any longer. How much is carer's um, allowance, Laura? Just remind us. It's less than job seekers, so it works out about £58 a week. And this is um, your this is your sole income? Yes, after I had to claim it purely because I had to stop working. And so um, th you replace your wage as a full-time worker with £58 yes. pounds a week so you can look after your mum, who would otherwise yes. have fallen on the mercy of the state. And would have cost a fortune for the mm. state. Um, and I always did it because I was glad to do it. Um, but when you have no other income, you have to rely on benefits, yes. which is topped up by income support. Right. So because they have computer-generated checks, I was called in and told that my benefits were being stopped until they did a check to make sure I wasn't earning as well as claiming because you can only work 20 hours a week right. and claim carers allowance. Got you. Which was fine, but I wasn't going to have an appointment to see them for four months and they weren't going to pay me in the meantime. So I was told I was getting no money until... Because they had suspicions that you were working too yes. much. They had no proof or, or reasons. Yes, but I actually wasn't working at all. But what, what, what were their um, suspicions based upon, do you think? Did there, they were, give... there, was no, there was no suspicions based upon it's computer generated. So you're basically picked at random. To be checked, computer. to be audited, yes. as it were. Yes. But, they, but you have a four month cessation yes. of ink, a four month sanction effectively yes. until you can yes. prove that you're innocent of what they've accused uh -huh. you of random. I, forgive me for finding that hard to believe because you, you mean I, I, I'm sure you're telling me the truth it's a mark of my yeah. own ignorance but they yeah. can they can randomly select you for an audit and then not yeah. conclude the audit for four months during which period you cease to receive the benefit and this is is Scottish yeah. government policy identical to English well no they, they, um, our government have no control over it oh okay it's through Westminster. so it comes from um, Westminster yeah. oh, you poor so thing what, what did you do how did you cope through I have family that, that's seen me through and my church is really good to me. So oh. 
So they started helping me out, but eventually I actually went to my MSP and my MP, yes. who are both um, SMP, and, and they helped me, and they actually contacted the benefits office and got me seen, and I had to provide six months worth of bank statements, and, and I was treated like a criminal. I was guilty until about, Guilty until proven innocent. Exactly. Um, but when I phoned and I asked, you know, how am I supposed to cope? I was told, you know, do you not have things you can sell to, <laughs> to pay your bills? Um, there must be people you can borrow money from. And th these are the these are the DWP employees saying this to you. Yes, yes. When I was calling up and asking, how am I supposed to survive? Um, and it was appalling. And I had no idea. I'd heard of benefit sanctions before, but really, in my own ignorance, I never thought it would apply to someone like me. No. Um, and until and now, that's how it works, isn't it? And we never think it's going to apply to someone like us, so, so we just um, look no, away. Exactly, and it's it's something I will never forget. It was probably one of the, the hardest times that I've ever gone through, as well as looking after someone who was incredibly unwell yes. um, and having to deal with that. And she's on disability, so there's not a lot of money to go around. Um, You're a lovely daughter. I hope you don't mind me saying that. Not, not, thank not... you very much. I really appreciate that. And how is your mum? Thank you. She's, she's, she's doing all right. I'm back at work. Right. Um, and we, we get by. But, um, you know, it's it's hard. It's really, really it hard. And there's not a lot of help out there. And, and a lot of people... And, it, you know, the people that you would speak to and you would say, oh, you know, this has happened, people automatically look at you with suspicion. Yeah. People automatically look at you as if there's something, you know, that, you, well, you must have done something. They don't just stop your money for nothing. And actually, they do. It's, it's incredibly hard. And, you know, I thought, you know, that you can either get really upset about it or you can speak out and, you know, and I will support anyone who's against benefit sanctions. But it depends who's listening, doesn't it? Do you know something else, Laura, exactly. that you've just done? Incorrigible FCA, who's one of my favourite people on Twitter, has pointed this out, yeah. that almost every caller that we've had since 11 o'clock today has prefaced their story by insisting and, and reminding us that they'd all had you'd always paid your taxes you'd always had jobs so it's almost it's almost as if that guilt until proven innocent is now entrenched into the national psyche even of people like you who've ended up on the wrong end of the stick you still feel that you have to kind of prove that i, that I do, do you see what i mean the presumption is that you're, you're feckless you're a layabout you've got a flat screen tv and a holiday home in florida so the first thing you say when you come on a program like this which is being sympathetic to people in your position is i'm not a sponger i'm not a scrounger honest honest i promise i've always and, and that's heartbreaking i do understand that but i also think it's because in the, the case of like my mum yes. who's never been able to work who has yes. a good medical condition that means that she's completely incapable physically to do anything. And she receives regularly back to work letters, one of which she received when she was in intensive care. Even if she didn't attend, her money would be stopped. So, so again, with Windrush, this is a dehumanising exercise, whether deliberate or not is, is, is for people to decide for themselves. But these policies can only work if people like you and your mum are rendered somewhat less human. Absolutely. And, so, that, and that is why they got away with it and continue to do so. Eternally grateful for the people who, you know, my MP and my, F, my MSP, because they were phenomenal and within days had situation resolved. It's, uh, it's often the way, isn't it, with these kind of endemic lethargies, these, these systemic failures in systems, is that you need sharp elbows, either your own sharp elbows or... if The thing is, though, Laura is articulate enough and experienced enough and, and savvy enough to know who to call and how to make her case and who to get involved and what to say, and there'll be a lot of people who aren't, and I refuse to feel anything but sympathy for those people. You know, I, th I thought Robert in Rochester was the best example. Right? His own description of himself has been completely illiterate. That automatically robs him of so many avenues down which the rest of us could go if we found ourselves on the receiving end of this sort of behaviour, as Laura demonstrates. But even being professional, articulate, educated, even there, you, you, you can't fix it yourself. You need to call upon the politicians. You need to seek outside professional help. And still it goes on. And the front page story of most right-wing newspapers today is Michael Gove's decision potentially to reduce the number of wood-burning stoves in the country. 12.13, Jeff is in Bournemouth. Jeff, what would you like to say? Well, first of all, James, um, yes, those stoves can be mighty smoky if you're not careful. <laughs> um, I, I've uh, had MS for um, 34 years, and I had to give up work yes. um, uh, 17 years ago. Um, 
you're talking about the um, you need sharp elbows and you need to know where to look and um, to be uh, literate and to, to, to be able to have the confidence yes. to deal with uh, the powers that be. Uh, my wife and I are in the very fortunate position that um, we, we are um, like that, but we had um, a little bit of a... Uh, uh, shall I say, a, a problem with the, the old heartbeat when I got my letter to say that um, I was being transferred over from um, disability living allowance over to a personal independence payment. Uh, the booklet that came through, and it is a booklet, yes. is deliberately intimidating. Um, each question has uh, three or four parts, and at each juncture... Um, the Department for Work and Pensions are looking for a certain reaction so as they can uh, minimise the amount of money that they pay you. Um, no wonder people get um, upset and and uh, and very very uh, very disturbed um, by all this. We had a um, friend who told us about um, uh, a voluntary organization called uh, Benefits and Work Online, which are absolutely brilliant. Um, but without their help, um, we would have been um, very much lost. And that, you think the system is designed to, 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 to sort of leave people by the wayside because they couldn't keep up with the bureaucracy? Oh, and oh, the... It's uh, and, that, and, that, and that's how they're judged. That's how they're judged as successful or not. How many people did you sanction this week? I didn't sanction any. Everybody's got enough money to live on, and um, things are looking up for all of my clients. Well done. Have a bonus. That's not how it works. How many people did you sanction this week? 48, boss. Well done. Have a biscuit. Yeah, if, you, if you just look at the, um, the booklet they send you to fill out, um, it becomes quite clear that um, they are there to intimidate and to um, stop people... Um, uh, stop people claiming, or at least yes. to give a, a very, not flippant, but a very, um, oh, how shall I say this, um, very... Oh, um, Go on, I'm normally good at guessing uh, what words people mean, but you've, you've, I can't help you out here, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. No, this, is a, this is a problem. Um, and also, my um, interview, I, I went... Because there was no um, wheelchair accessible office uh, for, I think it was ATOS uh, yes. in Bournemouth, oh, I had Lord. to travel to Southampton. So that was a, a 64 mile round trip. Um, I then had a two hour interview in a windowless room. Um, and bearing in mind one of the um, well known symptoms of MS yes. is um, fatigue. Yes. Um, I was expected to go through that, and eventually I scraped through uh, on the point system right. by about two points, and half of the uh, information that was um, uh, put down about me during that interview was wrong. And this can only happen if the system is designed in the way you've described and the people who ordinarily are charged with blowing the whistle, setting off the alarms when this is happening to ordinary people are instead portraying people like you as either being deserving of the indignity that was heaped upon you or as being lying. Well, I have to say, I have to say that um, um, I actually did pay all my taxes and didn't try to dodge any of them. Um, but again, how, how weird that we've ended up in a place where we all feel the need to, to, to put that on the table as a credential because we're all trying to say, this morning's show, this afternoon's show, we're all trying to say, no, 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 I'm not one of them. I'm not one of them. I might, I might need welfare support. I might need my DLA. I might need my job, but I'm not one of them. And yet, where are they? We've built an entire system around a perception of uh, unemployed people, disabled people, needy people. We've built an entire system under Ian Duncan Smith around the perception that they're all on the lam. I'd love to see him look Jeff in the eye and explain his ideology. Jeff, take care, mate. And we are going to move on from that conversation about um, 
uh, benefits sanctions. I'll just leave you with a, with a last word from Donna. James, I had a full-time brilliant career in security for 22 years. I then got shoved down four stairs and I'm now disabled. But I'm treated like a liar and a scrounger. The PIP assessment was a terrifying ordeal. We are set up to fail, James, to save the DWP money and to help staff gain bonuses. I, I, there's no, I don't think there's conclusive evidence of... Um, the, the bonuses being linked to the number of people that get sanctioned. In fact, I, 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 I double check, but I'm pretty sure that that would, even that, surely that would have breached the news reporting thresholds of some of the more right leaning institutions. I am doing this time, time.